Hello guys, my name is Nash. Welcome to Thursday Tales of Terror. TTT. Today's case happened in China and it's pretty unknown internationally but it's pretty well known in China itself. Now you won't be able to find any English articles on today's case but if you're interested, I will leave the link to the Chinese articles down in the description box below. This case happened in the year 2013 where two fishermen found a strange luggage floating at sea. Why did I say strange? That's because this luggage was placed in an iron frame with iron chains around it. It was weird and it seemed like whoever did this wanted the luggage to be closed forever. The contents of the luggage though was quite horrific and it turned out that there was a dead body inside. But what made this case really unique was that the identification of the body was made possible through a serial number on a silicone breast implant belonging to this deceased. So the question is, how did this person end up in the luggage? On June 30th, 2013, just like any other day, fishermen were out at sea with their boats in Shanto, Guangdong. It was a very ordinary day until two fishermen spotted a suspicious object floating on the water near Louis Island from afar. They got curious and they decided to move closer to the object. It was a luggage but this was no ordinary luggage. They decided to move even closer and they brought the luggage onto their boat. Upon closer inspection, the fishermen were very confused as the luggage was placed in an iron frame welded with steel pipes and surrounding the frames were chains, thick chains. There were also two big locks to secure the chains. Why was this luggage so heavily secured and why was it thrown at sea? So they began to wonder, is there some mysterious items inside that needs to be locked up or perhaps some treasure? It's part of human nature to be curious so they eventually decided to open the luggage. To the fishermen, it was a very scary but exciting moment for them. It's not every day that you'll find something out of the ordinary at sea but they were scared because they didn't know what to expect. They brought some tools over and it took them a while and a lot of effort to open the heavily secured luggage. When they finally managed to get the luggage out of the iron frame, there was a weird smell emanating from it. It was not a good smell, it was a very unpleasant smell. They were taken aback by the smell but they decided to just go ahead and open the luggage. So they unzipped the luggage and inside was a big black garbage bag. And as soon as they opened the luggage, the unpleasant smell became stronger. They proceeded to open the big black garbage bag and they saw a body. It wasn't a full body. The body was highly decomposed and the body was missing the head, the neck and the right leg. The Shanto Police Department was immediately alerted about this gruesome discovery and they quickly rushed to the scene to investigate. Due to the luggage being out at sea for so long, the body was not in a good condition at all. But after inspecting the remains in the luggage carefully, they were able to confirm some details more or less. The victim was a female. She was naked and tied up in the luggage. Head, neck and right leg were missing. She was slim with a tattoo on her left thigh and she had red nail polish on her toenails. The victim should be someone really young, 18 to 26 years old about there and she should be about 160 to 165 centimeters tall. The police immediately set up a special task unit to investigate on this brutal murder. Now because the victim was found at sea, there could only be two possibilities. The location of the crime where the girl was killed could be somewhere close to the sea but it's also possible that the killer chose to abandon the body at a faraway place from the original crime scene. The police needed to find the exact location of abandonment in order to get more leads but it was rather difficult for them. The luggage could have drifted from the original abandonment location due to currents. So the police decided to shift their angle of investigation. Instead of finding the original abandonment location, they decided to focus on the body. But it's also not easy for them because the head was missing. They decided to let the forensic pathologists do their work. Once the forensic test report was out, they managed to get a more detailed profile on the victim. It was confirmed that the victim's age was around 22 to 23 years old. Her cause of death was suffocation and she should have passed on for about a month before her body was found. There is also another major detail that they found that will help identify the body and eventually crack this case. According to the forensic report, the victim was said to have gone through a breast augmentation surgery surgery and so there were silicone gels in her chest and in these silicone gels there were identification serial numbers so police wasted no time and started tracking these serial numbers down. On July 1st 
2013, the police found the manufacturer of the silicone gels through the serial numbers. The manufacturer told the police that the serial numbers represent a model batch. So this model batch produced a total of 29 silicone gels and all of them were sent out to different plastic surgery companies. The manufacturer also provided the police a list of all the plastic surgery companies that purchased that batch of silicone gels. After going through the list, they found out that 15 out of the 29 silicone gels have already been used. The data of the 15 clients were pretty much similar to the victim and the police decided to check them out one by one. Soon enough, they found a plastic surgery clinic in Chuhai, Guangdong where a female client had visited them on April 3, 2013 to get her breast augmentation surgery. According to the staff there, they were unable to reach this client after the surgery was done. They wanted to check if she was okay and if there was any discomfort, which were the usual follow-up after a surgery, but she was not responding. And this client, her name was Xiao Qing, and Xiao Qing's physical characteristic were very matching with the victim. Police then tried to search for Xiao Qing, and shockingly enough, they came across a police report. Apparently, Xiao Qing's parents had reported Xiao Qing as missing in Shenzhen about two weeks ago. Without any hesitation, the police immediately contacted Xiao Qing's parents. Xiao Qing was born in the year 1991. Her hometown was at Guangxi, Yuling, Beiliu City. She moved to Zhuhai and has lived there for quite some time. She was a fashion model. On June 7, 2013, she had a shoot in Shenzhen and she stayed at her friend's house. During her second day at Shenzhen, she went missing. Nobody was able to contact her. Was it really Xiao Qing that was in the luggage? Now, Xiao Qing's friend managed to confirm that Xiao Qing indeed had a tattoo on her left eye and the two painted red toenails together. The pieces of information were starting to come together. On 2nd July 2013, the police conducted a DNA test with Xiao Qing's parents and did a comparison. True enough, the body in the luggage was confirmed to be Xiao Qing. After confirming that the victim was Xiao Qing, the police shift their investigation towards the relationships surrounding her. For example, her colleagues, her friends, her lovers. It was reported that Xiao Qing has a boyfriend in Hong Kong, but they were very loving. She was very proud of him and they didn't seem to have any problems with each other. So her boyfriend and even her ex-boyfriend were ruled out as suspects because there was no motive found. Xiao Qing was also known to be a very hardworking girl. She often got a lot of project on hand and she was very busy and dedicated to her work. According to people who knew Xiao Qing, they say that she didn't offend anyone, so the possibility that the murder was committed on the basis of revenge was highly unlikely. Was she killed by a stranger instead? Let's go back to when her body was found. When her body was found, she was stuffed in the luggage. The police decided to use the same method as before. They went to take a closer look at the luggage to see if they could find any serial numbers and then from there they could locate the manufacturer and hopefully be able to narrow down the suspects. Based on the trademark on the luggage, the police found the manufacturer but this angle of investigation wasn't working too well with the police. The manufacturer informed the police that this type of luggage is very common. They don't usually produce the luggages in small batches. In fact, thousands of batches will be produced and distributed throughout the country. Because of this, it's impossible to keep track of a certain batch. And because they ship it to everywhere, it could be to a shop specializing in selling luggages, it could be to a night market stall. So there's no way you could trace the buyers of the luggages. Hence, the police decided to forgo this plan. While the investigation was still ongoing, it appeared that someone was still using Xiao Ting's bank card. Someone was withdrawing money with her bank card. The person reportedly withdrew money from Xiao Qing's bank card three times in three different locations. The person withdrawing the money would have different appearances each time. On one occasion, he was wearing a headband that seemed out of place, and another time, he could be seen wearing a cap and he wore it really low to prevent recognition, and another time, he was wearing a hoodie and his hood was tightened around his head. I think he tried his best to hide himself from the camera without looking too suspicious in public, but the CCTV still managed to capture his features. When the image of him was shown to Xiao Qing's family members and friends, no one was able to identify the guy. He was not familiar at all and they don't seem to recall Xiao Qing ever hanging out with him. But why was Xiao Qing's bank card with him and how did he know the password to the card? At this point, the police believe that Xiao Qing could have been killed for her money. After 
all, she was working as a model and she was earning well. The police immediately tried to trace her other valuables like her handphones and her other bank cards. On July 6, 2013, two of Xiao Qing's mobile phones were found at a phone shop in Shenzhen, Huaqiang Bay. The police began to question the shop owner, whose surname was Huang. From here on, the police finally managed to identify the suspect. Mr. Huang said that the two phones were given to him by his older cousin, Huang Feishan. At about 6 a.m. on July 7, 2013, the Shantou police arrested the suspect. They arrested Huang Feishan in a rental house in Guiyan Road in Shenzhen. They found six credit cards and one watch belonging to the victim on him. After comparison with the images from the bank, he was the same person who withdrew the money from Xiao Qing's bank card. According to a report, after Huang Feishan was arrested, he quickly confessed to what he did. Huang Feishan was born in 1983 in Zhaoyang, Shantou, Guangdong. He's married and has a young daughter. He mainly gets his income from driving a taxi. But I don't think he has a taxi license or he wasn't registered, so he was working as a taxi driver illegally. In China, they call it black taxi, hecha, for like the illegal taxi drivers. Huang Feishan was also a gambling addict. Because of his addiction to gambling, he was in a huge debt. His debt amounted to more than 100,000 yuan, which was equivalent to about USD $15,000. He then had this idea of robbing and killing. He said he had not much of a choice, and so he began planning. He first started his plan by renting a house in the Kengzi area, Longgang, Shenzhen. This rental house is quite unique because it has a shutter door. If you leave up the shutter door, you can drive your car directly into the house. Huang Feishan also reportedly went to Shenzhen Dongmen Street to buy the luggage and knife. After everything was prepared, he drove his taxi around every day. On the 8th of June 2013, at about 3 p.m. at Xingyuan Road in Shenzhen, Xiao Qing was preparing to head over to her shoot location in Longhua District and got in a taxi. And it was so unfortunate that the person driving that taxi was Huang Feishan. At that time, Xiao Qing was dressed in what seemed like expensive clothing and she was carrying a branded bag. She looked very classy and elegant and it caught the attention of Huang Feishan. Huang Feishan Shan then struck up a conversation with Xiao Qing. They began chatting and he learned that Xiao Qing has a rich Hong Kong boyfriend. At that point, he thought that Xiao Qing might be the perfect target for him to rob, but he was hesitant. Do I need to do this? Should I really do this? Now along the journey, the weather then was really hot, but Huang Feishan's aircon was not strong. He purposely put it in a low mode to save on gasoline. But Xiao Qing was feeling very hot and stuffy and soon enough, they got into an argument over the aircon. According to Huang Feishan, the argument got very intense and Xiao Qing even went to the extent of humiliating him. She said things like, no wonder you are only a taxi driver and you can only be one for the rest of your life. And because these humiliating words triggered Huang Feishan, he made the decision then to kill her. But of course, we won't know if this was what really happened on that day. Xiao Qing is already dead, there's no way to verify if it's true or not. Could this be a story he made up to try and lessen his sentence? We never know. And then suddenly, Huang Feishan stopped his car at a remote place. He told her that he would be getting some tools from his boot to try and fix the aircon. But instead, he took a knife out and threatened Xiao Qing with it. Xiao Qing got scared and she remained still. He proceeded to seal her mouth with tape and tied both her hands with wire. He asked Xiao Qing to lie in the back of his car while he drove his car to his rental flat in Kengzi. In this rental flat, he raped her. He also forced Xiao Qing to tell him her bank card passwords. After that, he went out to buy some water. When he returned home, he heard Xiao Qing screaming for help. He immediately rushed in and quickly covered her mouth. He also put a plastic bag over her head and because of this, she was suffocated to death. He didn't know what to do with her body and after thinking for a long time, he finally had a plan. He decided to pack her body in a luggage and throw it into the sea. He didn't want to just throw the luggage into the sea just like that. He wanted to make sure that the luggage would sink. And that's when he decided to put the luggage in the iron frame with chains around it to add on weight hoping that it would sink into the river. After that, he drove the body back to his hometown in Guangpu area at Shantou and he threw the luggage into the Rongjiang River. 
Initially, Huang Feishan was very confident of his plan. He was very sure that the added weight will make the luggage sink into the river. However, the luggage remained floated. He hurriedly tried to find more items to make the luggage heavier. But as he was doing so, the luggage had already drifted very far away. He could only pray that the luggage would drift to somewhere far where nobody would find it. As mentioned earlier, some of Xiao Qing's body parts were missing. In his rental unit at Kengzi, he reportedly used a blade to dismember the body and that's when he also removed her head. These remaining body parts, he put them in a cardboard box and sealed it with cement. He placed this box in another rental flat at Guiyan Road where he lived with his wife. The wife was only aware of this when the police came to arrest him. Imagine how shocked and traumatized the wife must be to learn that there is body parts stashed in her house all this while. During the trial, Huang Feishan admitted to the robbery charge but he said that he had no intention to kill the victim. He had only wanted to stop Xiao Qing from getting help and he had killed her accidentally. But of course Xiao Qing's family didn't believe his story and they insist that this was a planned murder. They proposed for Huang Feishan to compensate them 850,000 yuan, which was about USD $133,000. However, Huang Feishan's family situation was not well to do. His parents divorced when he was only 12 and both parties can only try their best to collect money to compensate. They did their best and both parents only managed to collect 220,000 yuan in total. That amount was nowhere close to the 850,000 yuan that Xiao Qing's family was asking for and so they refused to settle. A mediation was done and the court staff tried to talk to both sides. And it's indeed true that with Huang Fei Shan's family situation, 220,000 yuan was really the best that they could offer. They tried really hard. In the process of mediation, a lot was said about the details of compensation. Xiao Qing's family had difficulties understanding the process or what was discussed due to their dialect. As you may know, there are many dialects in China and it was said that Xiao Qing's family are not well versed in Mandarin. But because they wanted to settle this matter as soon as possible, they eventually accepted the 220,000 yuan as compensation and signed on a document as agreement. Here's the mistake. Xiao Qing's family actually signed the document without carefully reading the contents of it. They assumed that the signing was just to agree on the 220,000 yuan, but in the document, it also stated that Xiao Qing's family would forgive Huang Fei Shan for his crimes. On September 25, 2014, the court sentenced Huang Fei Shan to death with a two year reprieve. This sentencing was based on the fact that Huang Fei Shan and his family have been actively compensating. Xiao Qing's family and being able to obtain their understanding. Xiao Qing's family were obviously not happy with the result and filed for a complaint. They said that they have never thought to forgive Huang Feishan for what he did and they would rather return all the money back in order for him to get executed immediately. They also mentioned that the mediator did not explain the agreement properly. And even though they have signed on the document, it doesn't represent the wishes of the family. Now let me explain just a little bit on what the death sentence with a two-year reprieve means. Now the death sentence with a two-year reprieve in China mean that at the end of their two-year reprieve, the death sentence may be commuted to life imprisonment if the convict has not committed to an intentional crime during the two-year reprieve, or to a fixed term imprisonment of 25 years if the convict has performed great meritorious service. Unfortunately, what's done is done, they have already signed on the document and it's in black and white. I tried to search if Huang Feishan was indeed given the death sentence after his two-year reprieve but unfortunately, I couldn't find any information. Now moving on, shortly after the case was solved, something bizarre actually happened. According to local customs in Beiliu City, Guangxi, unmarried women are not allowed to be buried in their hometown, which was Xiao Qing's hometown. So Xiao Qing's body was sent to a funeral home in Shenzhen for cremation. And from there, Xiao Qing's parent would bring her ashes back home. At that time, Xiao Qing's Hong Kong boyfriend was also present. Now because Xiao Qing's family was busy handling court matters, her Hong Kong boyfriend offered to take care of her ashes. So Xiao Qing's family handed the ashes over to the boyfriend, 
But weirdly, he disappeared with the ashes. After Xiao Qing's family was done settling with the court matters, they wanted to get the ashes back, and so they tried to contact Xiao Qing's Hong Kong boyfriend. But he couldn't be reached at all. He just vanished. So they made a police report regarding the ashes, and later it was learned from the police that Xiao Qing's Hong Kong boyfriend was actually a married man. It was very shocking because Xiao Qing and her Hong Kong boyfriend had been in love for several years, and they even lived together in Shenzhen. Unfortunately, no one knows where the ashes are, why do he even need the ashes for, what's his purpose, nobody knows. It's really sad for the victim's family, and there is truly no worse outcome than this. Hopefully one day they will be able to track this Hong Kong guy down and get back their daughter's ashes. Thank you for staying with me till the end. I'll see you guys next Thursday with another video. Bye!